Well, greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to tonight's second half. Before we jump into this very terrifying set of experiences, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click that like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's second half, shall we? Today's first part of the upload. This experience happened to my cousin who was visiting our grandmother on Navajo Nation Reservation. He was what you would call an urban Navajo, born and raised in Phoenix and rarely visiting the res. He was raised in the church and was aware of certain Navajo taboo and folklore, but didn't heed any or abide by any. Him and his older brother used to stay at her grandmother's during the summer to help out with chores and livestock. They called it sheep camp. However, sheep camp was a summer lodge or cabin in the mountains where you took the sheep during the summer months to graze. Being from the city, I guess they just like the term sheep camp, when in reality it was just our grandmother's permanent residence. Like most rural residents on the res, old automobiles and appliances that no longer worked piled up in the front yard due to lack of transportation or waste management options. There was an obsolete fridge from the 80s on the far side of my grandmother's porch and a broken down muscle car from decades earlier. The car was more of a skeleton, a forgotten remnant, that rested about 30 feet far off the left in perfect eyeline sight from the porch. The model of the car I can't remember, but the windows had been all busted out and the upholstery weathered and cracked. The desert sand reclaimed most of it. The tires were shredded and half buried. If you grew up on the res, this served as a derelict jungle gym or playground. My mother and I had decided to visit my grandma one summer afternoon when I was 12 years old, the same age as my cousin. We greeted everyone upon our arrival and our grandmother fed us. My cousin asked if I wanted to walk to the canyon and told me he had something to tell me with urgency. As soon as we were out of earshot of any of the adults or his older brother, he told me that something had happened earlier that day at around 5.30 in the morning. Although it was summer in the Arizona temperate desert, it's easily many degrees colder at night and early mornings. He told me he was awoken by the urge to relieve himself. The sky was dark blue before dawn. He was half asleep, and it was too cold to run all the way out to the outhouse, no inside plumbing. So he continued to say he darted to the left to pee behind the old fridge off the porch his eyes half closed and his mind still a bit hazy from just waking up. Then he hears the distinct sounds of something jagged and sharp scratching in long successions on the metal, accompanied with a heightened whimper of a sheepdog. His eyes open wide and he tries to scan the horizon to locate the origins of the hurt sheepdog. Initially, he thought he saw the dog trapped in the car, but there were no windows or glass obstructing the dog's escape from the wreckage. He witnessed the dog clawing and scratching to fight its way out of the window frame of the door side. Its front paws, or claw, at the outer shell of the driver's door, making the sound of the nails on the chalkboard. He finished urinating and, dazed, took one step off the porch. 
to help the dog out of the car. Suddenly he freezes in his tracks as the cold, wicked laugh rips through the early dawn air. His eyes immediately fixate on where this laugh originated from, inside of the car. He rubs his eyes, focuses his gaze on the dog, and his eyes follow along the dog's torso. And then he sees that something has its arms and claws wrapped around the waist of the dog, preventing it from escaping. At this point, the sun had inched and crept over the mesa and turned the sky from pale blue to pale yellow. The pale yellow light reveals that the driver's side door of the car is completely covered in smeared blood. He jolts back inside, bolts the door behind him. He doesn't tell anyone because he is paralyzed with fear, fear that if he talked about it, nothing would stop it from busting in the door and killing him, his brother, and our grandmother. I inquired about what it looked like or if he even saw what had been holding the dog against its will. He said it looked like a werewolf, but a sickly werewolf with mange. He noted that it was hairy, but you could see almost dry, cracked gray skin underneath. He said before he ran, he slouched down to see what was holding the dog inside of the car. And, whatever it was, grinned. Its wicked smile was filled with sharp, jagged teeth beaming from side to side. In all honesty, I thought he was lying to me and trying to scare me, thinking I was some dumb, uncivilized rezzer who would believe a werewolf tale. We spent some time in the canyon playing on boulders and throwing rocks into a stream. I had all but forgotten what he shared with me until we made it back to my grandmother's house. That's when he asked if I wanted to see the scene of the crime. I was skeptical at the time. Until we walked up to the car in question, I couldn't believe it. There were tufts of bloody multicolored dog fur caught in the window frame and a bloody paw print smeared on the outside of the driver's side door. There were long scratch marks from the dog everywhere, not sharp enough to cut through the metal, but enough to make slight indentations, as if the nails were scratching down with so much pressure that the protein from the nails, or whatever nails are made of, buckled and gave way, filed down on the metal. I stood there in amazement and fear. All we did was throw dirt on the bloody markings, and I haven't spoken of it until just now. Side note, the sheepdog was not murdered. We spent all late afternoon looking for her. The dog was a female. We later found her under an abandoned manufactured home on the property. She was afraid to come out for a couple of weeks, so my cousin said he always brought her food and water for the remainder of the summer break. Today's second part of the upload. I live in the woodland part of the upper panhandle near Pittsburgh. While some of the town is buildings and restaurants, when you leave that town, it gets pretty scary. We have what I think is a nature preserve called Tomlinson Run. They have hiking trails, camping trails. To set the scene, it's a muggy summer day around mid-June with heavy rain. I was out with my friends going on a camping trip in the woods. We were going to go into the woods, but it was easier just to get a small cabin. They provide you with a fire pit around the back near the tree line. We're sitting at the fire having a few beers when it starts to pour. The heavy brush of trees over top of us hit us from the rain for the most part, so we stayed out near the fire. Once it started to fall off the leaves, we decided to call it a night. While packing up, being pretty tipsy, my friend, we'll call him Alex, had to take a piss. The only bathrooms in the park are near the building about a mile away, so it's common just to do your business by the shack. Keeping the fire dimly lit while we were packing proved to be a harder task. All of a sudden, while peeing, he turned around and started yelling to go inside. Him, not being one to joke around and having a serious tone, persuaded us to move our asses. We grabbed all of our chairs and firewood and hauled it into the cabin. He came in ten seconds after us and locked the door. He explained that he saw a wolf along the tree line, off to our right, stalking us, maybe looking for an easy snack. Now to make sure you get the layout of the cabins, I'll explain. Each cabin has four beds and one platform on the roof that someone could sleep in. The two beds are bunkers, and each had a window above the first bed and below the second. There was also a window on the top bed. 
The cabin was designed like an old Indian cabin with a round room and squared off walls being a cheap $50 a night. There was no lights or power outlets in some cabins. This was the case for our cabin. We expected this, having been there several times, so we brought flashlights and portable chargers. Once we get inside, we're all kind of just laying there planning out our next day. Since there were four of us, I decided to sleep on the second floor bed. I took the ladder up, then pulled it to form a railing. We all dozed off after it had been a long day. About halfway through the night, what I would... It's to be about two in the morning. I woke up to my friend, James, sprinting back into the cabin, screaming. Apparently, he went outside to pee and thought he heard a wolf howl, but in a deep tone. Now, this is strange, as we've never seen this many wolves around, and they usually have a high pitch howl. He then went on to say that when he turned to look where he heard the noise, he saw something standing on two feet with claw-like hands looking back at him. This freaked us all out, and we decided not to go outside until morning. We all got back to our beds. I turned over and tried to sleep. I had a very uneasy feeling in my stomach and felt as if someone was watching me. I rolled over and looked out the window, and that's when I saw it. It was crouched down, facing away from me, but its head was turned, staring at me. As soon as it realized I was looking at it, it stood up and sprinted away. Not like any sprint or person I'd ever seen, it was about eight feet tall and ran like an Olympian. I tried to brush it off as a hallucination, but I knew what I had just seen was real. The next day we all agreed to leave and I told my friends in the car what I had seen. Alex then said that's what he saw when he was peeing but didn't want to freak us out so we stayed quiet. I wasn't sure what it was at the time until I researched more. To this day, I have not been back to go to the campsite or into the woods. Sometimes when I'm walking at night around my neighborhood, I can feel eyes on me, and I know exactly what is watching me. Today's Third Encounter Around the time of the early 90s, I lived in New Mexico. I was a gang youth counselor at the time and worked with a number of houses where they classed as either residential treatment centers or drug and alcohol homes. What this really meant was that if you were in a residential treatment center, the clients in there were typically prone to more violence and behavioral issues. If you were a client at a drug and alcohol house, this often meant that you were high-risk youth who came from a sketchy family background. I worked in one of the drug and alcohol homes. My shift was three and a half days long, and that meant I had three and a half days off to go camping and other such things in New Mexico. I had a kid who was Navajo who was brought up in Big Res in Four Corners one night. He had been found wandering around in some really far-flung area on the res, and no one from any part of the tribe would claim him to raise. So they brought him to us. He was a big guy, and he had never spoke. Part of our cultural training with Navajo was to not make eye contact unless they initiated it. He kept his head down and remained silent. A few days went by, and since I lived in the house three and a half days a week, and then had three and a half days off, I had planned to go fly fishing in the Four Corners area on the San Juan River. It's a beautiful river. My last night in the house, the night counselor woke me up at around two in the morning, knocking at my door and whispering, you've got to come downstairs, the new kid is doing something weird. I go down, he's sitting in the middle of the living room chanting, and he's got this huge motherfucking knife. There's some other assorted items around. I really don't remember what. This was 93, but feathers were involved in some other things. And while he knows we are there, he simply continues this ritual. Now, I'm all for freedom of ritual, but knives are not allowed, or any sharps. And he was supposed to be in bed. Long story short, I call the police and the house therapist, and the police come and we have him removed. On his way out the door, he locks eyes with me and shouts something long and very much in Navajo, which no one understands. The next day, I go camping alone in the Four Corners campground near San Juan River. 
drive out there. Spooky. Low-lying ground fog from which these wild Navajo sheep, churro, emerge suddenly right in the middle of the road. The Navajo really don't pen their livestock so much. Anyway, it's spooky, but I push it aside, get to the campsite. Campsite was this place called Cottonwood Campground. Every 50 to 100 feet was a campsite. And it being summer, all the spots were taken. I had reserved mine, so I pull in, laid out my tarp, got my sleeping bag set. I was too poor for a tent. Plus, I had been raised by my father, who used to tell me that tents were for Democrats and liberals. I'm a liberal, by the way. I got a nice fire going, and while the flames cracked away, I tied some flies in to listen to the coyotes howl in the distance. On both sides of me, there was a truck and a camper. Both had plates from Texas. The truck had a tent, and the others were staying in their camper. I fell asleep near the fire and went into a dream. Well, eventually the dream turned into a very terrifying nightmare where some wild animal was attacking me. There was a primal sense to the dream I was unused to, and all I could hear was growling, snarling, and the detail was very real. I could even feel the hot breath near my cheek as something lunged toward me. Woke up, the sounds continued right next to me. I freaked out. What the fuck? Something. Some animal kept circling me in the darkness. I had brought a huge hunting knife and kept it next to my sleeping bag. Also, I was sleeping near my car, which I realized was a very good thing. I also had a flashlight. Unfortunately, I had forgotten to change the batteries in the flashlight, so when I turned it on and aimed it, it only dimly stayed on for 30 seconds. And in that 30, I saw a large, slash, actually huge, coyote snarling at me. When the flashlight went out, I threw it at this thing. And when it charged me again, I decided to burrow into my sleeping bag with the knife pointing straight up. I would kill it if attacked me by coming on top of the sleeping bag. I'll thrust the knife straight up into this creature's heart. Meanwhile, I'm screaming for help, screaming that I'm being attacked by something and I need a light or a gun or any kind of help. I'm being specific so people know I'm A, not crazy, B, not a criminal. I'm telling them that I need a light or someone to come out and help me. As I'm being attacked, no one comes to my aid. It's as if the entire campground doesn't hear me or is ignoring me. My neighbors are only 50 feet away. Nothing. This goes on for a half an hour. I'm scared shitless at this point. Finally, I got the damn thing to back up enough by throwing many rocks at it. Once it backs up for a minute, I decide... The risk of getting attacked, grab my keys, my knife, and my pants, and run to the car door. Heart in my mouth the whole way. Somehow, I get into the car without getting bitten. I turn on my headlights, and this gray shape slinks off into some brush about 30 feet away. Its eyes red and glowing at me through the shrub. I lie down in the hatchback, trying to calm myself down, but it's hard to do. Just when I'm catching my breath after 15 minutes, there's this sudden thump on the side of the car. I swear to fucking God, it's snarling in the window. Its salivating jaws are at my window and snapping in the air while looking straight at me, ferociously lunging to get into the car. Screw it, I fly out of there, leave my shit behind. I spend the night at a well-lit parking lot. When I went back to get my stuff the next day, the people camped on either side of me, didn't make eye contact or speak to me. It's like they were unaware of anything that had happened, or they were scared of me or something. Meanwhile, I'm pissed. When I got back to ABQ, some friends of mine, who used to play pool with twins, who are Navajo, half-jokingly suggested the kid had been some sort of black magic sorcerer or some shit and had cursed me successfully. While I'm a firm skeptic, it sure felt like it. And yes, I called the ranger station for the campground and told them about the attack. And they said they'd never heard of a coyote attacking a human out there and how skeptical they were of my story, especially since no one else had reported anything. But they would follow up if they found the animal. Shocker, I never heard from them again. 
Today's fourth part of the upload. My name is Mike. I'm 63 years old, recently retired from a soul-sucking IT analyst job for a major bank in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I was just a cog in the big money machine that facilitated movement of money across the globe, east to west. You can call it dollars, euros, yen, or ruples. It's all the same. Money flows like a river. It has currents and eddies up and down, diverted to and fro, damned and damned. You see trillions of monetary units flowing across the world and wonder if only a small percentage of it were diver diverted to help people out. Stamp out war, feed the hungry, health care for all who needs it. But that's not the game, and I had to leave it behind. I'm not here to comment on the vagaries of modern society. I'll leave that to the poets, priests, and politicians who are paid for their words and lies. So I retired to the country, not off the grid, but close enough to the edge, close enough to see footsteps from those who had come before me, the early pioneers, settlers, wagon tracks, homesteads of long-dead chapter in America, a time of exploration and discovery, a time where one man was deemed only a percentage of what makes up another man. By law, a time where cotton and tobacco were currency of the world, and they truly flowed on rivers. My best friend Galen and I love to explore the remnants of this bygone era before the march of modern society wipes them out forever. Luckily, I live in the largest and least populated county in Virginia, so there are many abandoned homesteads and graveyards from the late 1700s through the Civil War and subsequent migration out of the war-torn South. Galen always has her voice recorder and camera ready. I usually man the video camera. She has gotten many EVPs and filmed countless orbs and ghost manifestations. I guess you could call it that. She truly puts the ghost hunter shows on TV to shame. In our investigations, her one rule is to run if she says run, no question. A rule I obey, maybe 75% of the time. About 10 miles from my house, up on a hill, sits a large, mid-1800 mansion made inaccessible by lack of a driveway and a tangled thicket of brush and briar. There were vultures nested on the chimney. Talk about spooky. Of course, Galen was itching to investigate. I would always make up an excuse not to go there. It was too cold, too wet, too damn scary. But where most men would fear to tread, Galen goes, come on, and she is gleefully, which makes it all the more unnerving. So giving in to the inevitable, we go there and investigate. We park my truck below the house about 50 yards away. A beautiful autumn day in the Appalachian. So I couldn't weasel my way out of it this time. I had to admit I was curious as what the hell was in there. With the smell of sassafras and the chimney smoke in the air, we started to make our way through the brush. I was struck by all the debris around. I found a rusted out machete, war bottles, an old smashed up video camera. But the shoes, tennis shoes, and old moss covered boots littered the ground. We finally hacked our way up to the front porch. It was magnificent in its decay. The ornate banisters and eaves crafted in the day where craftsmanship ruled and deadlines were an afterthought. The inside was bone dry for the most part. There were many artifacts and clothing from previous tenants. And more shoes. There was even a TV from the 60s in one of the rooms, which seemed to be the last time the house was occupied. We proceeded to explore the mansion room to room. We separated Galen with her voice recorder and camera, me with my video camera. I went out back and found an old well with cement all around it. I looked over the edge, down into the well, as best as I could. I thought I saw a pair of golden eyes, but it was hard to see, so I adjusted the viewer of the camera and held my hand over the hole. In the viewer, I could clearly see a pair of dark golden eyes glowing in the darkness of the hole. I was just about to cry out to Galen when I heard her shout, Mike! Get up here, quick! 
She was at the back of the house in what looked like a kitchen. Off to the side was another leaf and debris-covered room with a hatch door in the middle. It looked to be a door for a root cellar, so we made our way to the door. It reeked of a stench of death in the room, and it got stronger the closer the door weighed down and what was looking to be blood leading up and down the steps. Galen goes, look. At the bottom of the steps was a carcass of a huge deer lying partially in the dim light of the small amount of sun that was made its way in and partially in the darkness of the root cellar. I was kind of relieved and thought to myself, well, that explains the blood and stench. I was just beginning to tell her I'm not going down there when the carcass suddenly and quickly was dragged out of the light into the dark. One of us screamed, I'm pretty sure it was me, Galen didn't have time to yell to run this time. We both bolted out of the room toward the front door. I let her go first out the front door, down the steps, and into the brush. If we were to be eaten, best it was me first. But I had the keys to the truck, the things you think of when you're about to be eaten. I got about 20 feet into the brush and looked back. What I saw shocked me to my core. In the darkness of the doorway, I saw two red glowing eyes, like brake lights of a semi-truck at night. I was frozen in my tracks. I was able to make out a dark shape in the darkness of the doorway. It looked like a huge dog or wolf, Bible black with huge pointed ears on the top of its head. It was then the eyes went into a malevolent squint, and then the motherfucker smiled at me. I could see the pure white teeth, the canines on either side, and the front teeth weren't rounded like dogs, but went straight across. It had a flat piggy snout, and I could see its nostrils flare as it lifted its head, as if to get my scent. It then lowered its head and laser-eyed into mine, down into my soul, eyes glowing so red that I initially felt that it had me. That I was his for the taking. I couldn't move and dropped to my knees, hanging on a tree. At this time, Galen screamed Mike with a hint of exasperation. That broke the hold it had on me. I bolted, pressing the door lock remote on the key fob so Galen could get back into the truck. I got in, fired the ignition, dropped it in gear, and spurred a rooster trail down the Gravel road, 20 feet into the air. What was that, Galen said. I replied, I don't know. Not sure myself what I had just seen. Maybe it was a bobcat, Galen said. You're probably right, I replied, relieved in the fact that she had not seen what I had. That she had not looked into the eyes of the devil as I did. That he didn't know who she was. That she wasn't on his list, I was. That's what I somehow felt was true. As we were driving away, Galen says, Do you think we could go back sometime and get that TV for my baby? I looked back in my rearview mirror at the house fading in the distance with vultures flying about wondering what had happened to their meal and said, We'll see, knowing full well I'd never go back there, not even travel on this road again. That was the fall of 2016. Galen has since moved an hour away due to her life. We don't get out too often. But although the winter of 2016 into 17, my encounter was in the back of my mind. Would it hunt me down? Was it scoping me out, waiting for the right time to take me? I live in a single wide trailer next to a lake with my two rescued cats, Little Boy and Adam. I let them out at daybreak and bring them in at night. Little boy likes to get up onto my roof, as does a family of raccoon. Sometimes at night the raccoon will run across my roof, freaking me out. I hope it's the raccoons anyway. There have been a couple times I have smelled that stench. It's the country and things die out in the woods, but I don't go off my back porch at night. Later on that spring of 2017, probably late May, I was driving in the country on Gravesbridge Road along with the Pig River. 
It's a gravel road, and I decided to park and get out and look at the fish sunning themselves in the primeval-looking shallows of the swamp S-curves of the pig. It was then I thought I heard a baby cry. I heard it again. It sounded very demonic. But I had to check it out. I have to admit I was scared when I made my way to the sound. I drew my pistol. It's a Taurus judge that either shoots 545 caliber Colt cartridges or 410 shot. I usually keep it loaded with four shots and one bullet. I made my way through the scrub and what I saw was heartbreaking. It was a dead mountain lion with its cub lying beside her body. I walked over to the scrawny cub. It growled at me pitifully and tried to run, but it collapsed after only a few feet. The mother was ripped to shreds. Whatever had done this to them, she had fought mightily. About ten feet over was an even sadder sight. It was another cub with its midsection completely eaten out to the spine. I assume this was the brother of what I later found out was his sister cub. She was missing an ear. Her eye was closed and covered in dry blood. I went back to my truck and got a Dollar General basket and a jean jacket I had in the back. I put my arms into the jacket and used to lift her and put her into the basket. She didn't fight, resigned to her fate. Kept telling her that you'll be fine, you'll be okay, little girl. When I brought her home, my cats freaked out. Adam went running to the back, but little boy was right there, curious as usual. She was bigger than them, but was in such a bad way she was no threat. I got a warm cloth and cleaned her eye. It opened and she had not lost it as she had lost her ear. She had four horizontal gashes on either side of her flanks. They weren't too deep and had scabbed up. I had some cat antibiotics, so I filled the syringe and squirted some into her mouth. The weird part was that she never fought me. I found that odd. I fixed up some warm milk and filled the syringe, and she drank it eagerly. I fixed up a box with some towels and put her in the back room. Little boy, who was more empathy than most people, insisted on staying by the box. Adam could give a shit. I ended up cutting out one side of the box so she could come and go. Little boy would curl up with her. I went ahead and named her Jet because of the gashes had healed, but the scars made her look aerodynamic and fast. She soon started eating Fancy Feast by the box. I ended up getting Alpo dog food that she ate heartily. I knew I should have called animal control, but I was afraid they'd put her down with the shape she was in. After about a week, she was up and about, little boy by her side. It was as if she had adopted him as her own brother. They would roll and play fight, and I could even play with her, but there was a look in her eyes, a lack of joy, as if she was on a mission. I wish I could say that she became a pet, that we are a family, but after about four weeks, she was playing with little boy in the front yard and then disappeared. I knew it was inevitable and that she would leave. She had a mission, a mission of revenge. Somehow I knew this to be true. Fast forward to the summer of 2019. I had almost completely forgotten about Jet and the wolf. That's what I will reconcile in my mind with what the red-eyed devil had been. I was out one day riding around looking for the Nazi house, a house that Galen and I found with swastikas painted on the walls. Very foreboding house. Anyway, I saw the old farmhouse about a hundred yards off the road through the pasture. I parked my truck and made the trek up the tall grass farmhouse. Typical abandoned farmhouse for this area with barn toward the back of the property next to the tree line. The house was filled with dust and trash, no artifacts. The barn was further back with a pond next to it, so I decided to check it out. I walked up and looked through the door when I saw it. It was the wolf creature. It was crouched down on its haunches with a small deer in its hands. It had hands with elongated fingers with claws on the end. 
It was feasting on this poor baby deer like a man would eat an ear of corn. Then it stood up and smiled at me. Holy shit, it must have been seven feet tall, holding the deer in one hand like a basketball. I say this because the beast looked like a basketball player. Thin at the waist with large, developed chest. It was a male because I could see its junk. The legs weren't like a man. But like a dog's, only longer. I knew this was a dog man at this point. I grabbed my pistol and turned to run simultaneously. I could hear it take off behind me. I had a 30-foot head start, but I knew I hadn't much time. I started firing behind me. I heard a yelp when the slug hit it, but I knew the 410 shot was only going to piss it off. I fired the last shot just as I reached the front side of the farmhouse. I knew I was a goner when I saw a flash of movement to my left off the front porch. I heard an incredible collision and a sound of growling. I turned and fell back. It was Jet. The one-eared bitch had jumped on its back and had a death bite on the back of its neck. I could see her powerful muscles bulging and heaving as she dug in that black bastard. It turned its head to try to get at Jet, and she just adjusted her bite to grab the front of its neck. It roared in a strangled howl. She glanced at me. The look on her face was pure revenge. I knew she was getting even for her mother and brother. Get that motherfucker, Jet, I yelled. Suddenly the dog man was able to grab Jet's left paw in its mouth, and she lost her grip on its neck. I took this as a sign to get the hell out of there and took off for my truck. I heard the battle just echoing through the valley. I got to the truck and turned just in time to see the dog man running back around to the barn. Jet limped on three legs back to the porch. I could see her breathing mightily as she licked her paw. She looked up at me, then to her left, jumped off the porch and ran as fast as she could to the edge of the woods. I was curious what she was doing when it was then that I saw why. She had two cubs waiting in the tall grass. The three of them started loving each other. She gave me one more glance then dissolved into the darkness of the tree line like a ghost in the woods. My heart leapt with emotion. I knew the battle wasn't over though. Out there in the deep woods there's a hidden war going on. If you are ever in the woods and come across a stench of death, turn and walk away as fast as possible. I count my lucky stars. I've looked into the eyes of pure evil, and I've survived. I've showed love and mercy to one of my fellow creatures of God, and it was returned to me tenfold. I feel I learned from this little boy. Adams could still give a shit. All right, guys, I hope you all enjoyed today's second half as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. Guys, thank you for supporting the channel. Your support is what continues to make this channel grow and go. And honestly, what makes it a place where people can share their experiences, ideas, and theories with zero ridicule, zero judgment, and just treated with the respect that we all deserve. Everyone stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real, they are out there, and they are dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about. It may just save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the answers, and God bless.